to open your Bibles this morning to the book of Philippians. And it's good to see a smile on these children's faces. Do you like the picture? That's Debbie's happy place. <laughs> really, that's Debbie's favorite place in, in, in all the world. Uh, it's called Hawaii. <laughs> and uh, I promised her before I married her 39 years ago that I would take her to Hawaii just as soon as they build a bridge. <laughs> and they've not built a bridge yet that I know of. But one day, we're going to get there. I thought that was a neat picture. And this will work if I turn it on. A message I want to share with you today, discovering the life that is real. And I want you to look at the book of Philippians chapter 4. I know I've preached from this passage of scripture since I've been at Canon Baptist Church, but the Lord laid this message on my heart for you today. I had a heartbreaking experience this week. A little girl got on my bus in tears. Her mom and daddy are going through a divorce. And she asked the question, is life really worth living? Now that's a tough question for me to ask myself. And that's probably a tough question for you to ask yourself. But for a precious little child, on my school bus. That's a heartbreaking question. The answer to that question is yes. Life is really worth living. We all have difficult circumstances in life at times. But Jesus said in John 10 and verse 10, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The word more abundantly means to the fullest. God wants you to live your life. It is worth living. And he wants you to experience a life that is real. Now, I think today the only life worth living is the life lived in and through and for and by the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, 4 through 7, Paul writes about that kind of life. Listen, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As you read those words, I think you can feel the passion of Paul's heart. Paul was excited. Paul was in a food. Paul was bubbling over with the joy of Jesus. You see, for Paul, life was not in existence to be endured. Life was an event to be enjoyed. Amen. Now, how can we live the life that is real? Well, you must practice the principles of real life. And you see those in verses 4 through 6. There are three ingredients that are always found in the life that is the real. The first is... Real life is a life of praise. Do you see that in verse 4? It says rejoice in the Lord. And what's the next word? Sometimes. Doesn't say sometimes, does it? Doesn't say rejoice in the Lord on the good days. No, it says rejoice in the Lord always. Amen. Again, I will say. Rejoice. Real life is a life of praise. For the Christian, praise ought to be the beat of our heart. Amen. Joy ought to be the breath in our lungs. 
It's amazing to me how many times as Christians we walk around as if we were weaned on a dildo. We have a sour face. And you know what happens when we show that sour face to the world? The world gets the wrong idea about Jesus. So if Paul looks like that and he knows Jesus, and if Paul acts like that and he knows Jesus, then maybe I don't need to know Jesus. No, we, we need to live a life of, of praise. If Jesus is in my heart, joy should be on my face. I'll tell you what my Uncle John Henry used to say, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. And, and that's true. What's in your heart, it's going to show in your life, it will show on your face, it will show in your actions. The evangelist Billy Sunday of many years ago said, if you have no joy in your Christianity, then you have a leak in your faith. If Jesus is Lord, if Jesus is your Lord, how can you have anything but joy in your heart? Now notice in that scripture there, the reason for rejoicing. What is it? Three words right in the middle. Rejoice in the Lord. This message is not from a preacher in a pulpit here in the book of Philippians. It's from a prophet in a prison. Paul is writing these words from a Roman dungeon chained to a Roman guard facing Roman death. And yet Paul's joy was as strong as ever. If you come to realize in your life there's a difference between happiness and joy. Now, I've learned in my life it's not possible to be happy all the time. But it is possible to be joyful all the time. There's a difference between joy and happiness. And you read your Bible, there's no scripture where God ever commands you to be happy, but God commands you many times to be joyful. Happiness is something that comes from without. Joy, on the other hand, is something that comes from within. Joy comes from the heart, and we can always be joyful in the Lord. Have you ever thought about the seasons for rejoicing? Winter, fall, spring, summer, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then again all day Sunday. That's the secret to the life that is real, rejoicing in the Lord. Be strong in the joy of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord will be your what? The joy of the Lord will be your strength. Real life is a life of praise. It's a life of joy. But then notice with me in verse 5, real life is a life of patience. The Bible says in verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Now, that word gentleness is a beautiful word. It's translated in some Bibles as patience. Really, what it is is long-suffering. Things don't always go my way. And things probably don't always go your way. What do you, you do when things don't go your way? What do I do when things don't go my way? Well, I'm to have patience. The Bible says, let your gentleness, your patience be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. I think what that scripture passage is telling us today is this. We should be gentle and patient in our dealings with people. Because we should always realize that the Lord is watching. Many years ago, I heard my favorite Adrian, my favorite preacher, Adrian Rogers, preach a sermon on the radio. And the name of the sermon was, Your Reactions Are Showing. I'd never heard a message like that before. I'd really never thought about what he shared in that message. But what he shared spoke to my heart. I learned from that message, your reactions reveal where your heart is. And that's very true. Your reactions reveal where your heart is. And the Word of God challenges us to show patience and gentleness in our dealings with others. 
when you've been wronged or when you've been hurt? How do you respond? I'm going to tell you, the thing that's needed in America today is for people to practice verse 5. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known to all men. One Sunday, a father and his boy were walking in the woods after church. The pastor had preached that morning a sermon on forgiveness. And the little boy had listened to the message, but he didn't really understand. So he asked his daddy, he says, Daddy, what, what is forgiveness? And just as that little boy asked the question, the father happened to see a beautiful rose bush. And he walked over to that rose bush. He picked one of those roses. He dropped it to the ground, and he crushed it underneath his foot. Now, you know what happened when he did that? crushing of that rose, immediately the fragrance of that rose filled the air. And the father said to his little boy, he said, son, do you smell that rose? And the little boy said, yes, daddy, yes, I do. And the father replied, he said, son, forgiveness is like the fragrance that a rose gives off when it is done. Now, let me ask you this morning, when you're set on, what kind of fragrance do you give off? Sometimes we give off the stink of revenge or getting back or getting even. <clears throat> we should give off the fragrance of forgiveness. A life that is real is a life that is filled with patience, graciousness, gentleness, kindness, forgiveness. Now, real life is a life also of Prayer, you see that in verse 6. It says, be anxious for nothing. That means literally don't worry about anything. The word there to be anxious, you know what it means? It, it literally means to be pulled apart. I think that's how this little girl on my school bus, school bus felt this week. Her whole life is pulled apart. What do you do when you're like? Well, human beings, all of us, I think, we worry. We're anxious. But there's a better thing to do than that. It's to pray. Look what it says. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. A life that is real is a life that is not consumed by worry. You know what worry does? Worry pulls tomorrow's clouds over today's sunshine. How many of you have ever solved a problem by worrying about it? There's a lot of things that concern me today in the culture and the time in which we're living. But worrying about those things will not help any of those things. I read a recent study on worry. It determined 60% of our worries are totally unwarranted. 20% are completely out of our control. Another 10% make no difference. And under the remaining 10% of our worries, only 2% are real. And these can easily be solved with appropriate action. I think every one of us, if we're honest today, would say, yes, I struggle sometimes with worry. Worry is part of being human. But there's a better path forward for us. Instead of worrying, pray. Worry is, I think, a denial of our trust in the Word of God. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says, God works all things together for good to those who love Him. And you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6? Jesus says, do not be anxious for tomorrow. Same word. Uh, why? Tomorrow will take care of itself. I read once about a man who was a tremendous worrier. This man couldn't sleep at night. He paced the floor over his worry. One day he came out of his house a totally different person. His neighbor said he was relaxed. He was singing. He was whistling. 
And the next door neighbor saw him. He said, well, what in the world's happened to you? And he said, well, I don't have a worry in the world today. I'm so happy. The neighbor said, how did you get rid of your worries? Well, I hired a professional worrier. And he does all my worrying for me. And the neighbor said, well, that, that sounds good. How much does this professional <clears throat> worrier cost? Well, it cost me about $1,000 a week. And the neighbor said, well, you don't have that kind of money. How are you going to pay him? And he said, that's his work. <laughs> now, I'm not telling you this morning you need a professional word. That's foolish. That's foolish. But I will say you today, I will say to you today, that you have a professional when it comes to handling your burdens. You read about him in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The things that are burdening, burdening you today, bring them to Jesus. We're to turn our cares into prayers. That's what verse 6 is literally telling us. Don't worry about it, pray about it. If anything is worth worrying about, it's worth praying about it. If it's not worth praying about, then it's not worth worrying about. But notice what it says about prayer. It says in everything we're to pray. We're to pray about everything. Now, I know there's some Christians that don't pray about much of anything, and there's other Christians that pray about some things. But God says in his word that every Christian ought to pray about everything. Let me tell you what my tendency is in life. My tendency is to go to God with the big thing. But I kind of feel like there's a lot of things not so big that I can handle myself. Big mistake. I need to go to God with everything. Because everything in my life is important to God. And I should pray in everything. I like to read I read not long ago about a fellow, he was talking about a friend of his who was a GI over in France during World War II. He was mopping the floor of the barracks, and the floor was just covered with soap. And about that time, bombs started to fall near the building where the man was mopping. And the man was frightened, so he tried to run on that slippery floor, and he couldn't run. He got tangled up in the pail and the mop. He ended up in the floor. He was struggling to get up in all of that mess. The bombs were dropping, and he began to pray. And this is what he prayed. He says, oh, God, if you'll just help me to get out of this mess, I'll get out of the next one all by myself. Well, I can sympathize with his situation. But I would say, there are no big or little things to God. There's nothing too small to your Heavenly Father when it concerns you, his child. My Bible tells me the very hairs on my head are numbered. God knows when a sparrow falls. God knows what you're facing. He knows about your concerns for your family. He knows about your concerns for your work. He knows about your concerns for your health. He knows about your concerns for your country. God knows the burdens of your heart. In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be known to God. And then the next part of that verse says, with thanksgiving, we ought to include Thanksgiving in every prayer that we pray. The one ingredient that must never be lacking is Thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now here's where many Christians sometimes have problems with prayer. Some of us are thinking today, well, I can thank God in the good times. I can thank God for the bad things, but how can I thank God for the bad times and for the bad things? Well, let me say this about that. If you're a Christian who only thanks God in the good times, 
you are thanking God for the wrong reason. We are not to thank God because things are good. We ought to thank God because God is good. Amen? Amen. We ought to be thankful in everything because God is good. Listen to what the Bible says, Psalm 135 and verse 3. It says, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. The Lord is worthy of our praise. No matter what our circumstances, no matter how deep our difficulties, there ought to be an attitude of gratitude in the heart of every child of God, I believe. Real life is a life of praise. But then you will experience the blessings of real life. That's what the promise is in verse 7. Look at it. You'll experience peace. What does it say in verse 7? And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The word surpasses means it just goes over and above and beyond. There's no way that you and I can understand what the peace of God is until we experience it. And once we've experienced it, we can't put it into words. Amen. This life that is real, the blessings of this life, you will experience God's peace. I think when you live a life of praise and patience and prayer, I can promise you that you will find peace. Now, I think everybody that today is looking for peace. The problem is many people look for peace in all the wrong places. There are people in our country today that look for peace in dope. So they'll smoke dope and they'll snort drugs. But they don't find peace there. There are some people in our world today that are looking for peace and pleasure. So what do they do? They go from woman to woman and from marriage to marriage and from job to job. And they don't find peace there. There are some people that look for peace and possession. So what do they do? They go buy a car or they buy a boat or they buy a house or they buy clothes or they buy shoes. But they won't find peace in those things. Some people look for peace in places, so they travel from one location to another location. They go from the one beach to another beach. They go from one mountain to another mountain. They're looking for something that they cannot find. You say, preacher, why can't they find peace? Because peace cannot be found in a pill and it can't be found in pleasure. It'll never be found in a possession. It won't be found in a place. Peace is only found in a person. And that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. You'll never have the peace of God until you find peace with God. And that peace is only found in Jesus. If you want the peace of God upon you, you need the God of peace within you, the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing that I think you'll experience, the blessing of this real life is, and you see that in verse 7? It will guard your hearts and minds. God's peace is also God's protection. The word guard is a word that refers to a garrison of soldiers charged with the responsibility of defending the sea. It's the peace of God that guards your heart. It's the peace of God that will guard your mind from the troubles of this world. I sat down and watched the news for a few minutes last night. And I sat down and watched it for a few minutes this morning. And I'm going to tell you, it's troubling. The answer for our day is the same as it's always been. It is the presence of Jesus. And it is Jesus Christ in our hearts who will protect our hearts. You see, the peace of God will protect us from discouragement. Everywhere I turn today, I meet people who are discouraged because things are very discouraging. Nothing is as it was. 
And people are beginning to wonder if things will ever get back to what they were again. What's the answer to that? Well, I think it's the peace of God that will guard your hearts and your minds. It'll protect you from discouragement. It'll also protect you from deceit. I think Satan has two strategies today. Satan will either try to discourage you from doing what is right, in order to do that, he attacks your heart, or he will try to deceive you into doing what is wrong. In order to do that, he attacks your mind. But what does God's peace do? God's peace guards your heart and your mind. It protects you. Oh, you and me need that peace and that protection. Isn't it a blessing? The, the life that is real, we, we experience those blessings, the blessings of peace, the blessings of protection. And the, the final thing I want you to see here is we will live in the realm of real life. I want you to see three words that close out verse 7. What are they? Through Christ Jesus. Three words close out verse 7. The secret to the life that is worth living, the secret to the life that is real is found in those last three words, through Christ Jesus. You and I need two things this morning. The first thing we need is we need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think I've already told you this morning, you'll never find peace by looking for peace. You'll only find peace when you look for Jesus. Some of you heard the name of John Wesley. I've got several books on my shelf authored by John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist Church, a tremendous Christian, wonderful preacher. He rode horseback over much of Georgia, starting churches, planting churches in his lifetime. But this is what he wrote in one of his commentaries. He said, when I look to Jesus, the dove of peace flew into my heart. And when I looked at the dove of peace, it flew away. So his conclusion is, look to Jesus. And that's my challenge for you today. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There are some people today who know about Jesus. And that's good. But you need more than a head knowledge of Christ to make a difference in your life. It's not a head knowledge that will save your soul. It's a heart belief, faith in Jesus Christ that makes all the difference. Not only does Jesus give you life, Jesus gives you life that is worth living. A song expressed it this way, friends all around me are trying to find what the heart yearns for by sin on their mind, but I have the secret. I know where it's found. Only true pleasures in Jesus abound. Jesus is all the world needs today. Blindly they strive, for sin darkens their way. Oh, to pull back the ground of curtains of night. One look at Jesus and all will be light. We need a personal relationship with Christ. Realize today that God loves you. Realize today that Jesus died for you. He shed his blood on Calvary's old rugged cross to pay the debt of your sin. He rose again on the third day. They placed him in a borrowed tomb of the grave, couldn't hold him. On the third day, he rose again, and through his resurrection, he assures us of forgiveness for our sins, fellowship with God, eternal life. You need today a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then you need a daily walk with Jesus Christ. Oh, the blessing to walk with Jesus. What a blessing it is to daily walk with Jesus. You say, preacher, what does it mean to daily walk with Jesus? <clears throat> it means two things to me. It means that we trust and that we obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. Trust and obey are the two feet upon which you walk the Christian life. 
I think trust and obey are the two eyes with which you see the blessings of God. Trust and obey are the two hands that receive the promises of God. To daily walk with Christ, we must trust and obey. Christianity is Christ. It's all about Christ, a personal relationship with God. To take Christ out of Christianity, it's like taking the water out of the well. It's like taking the blue out of the sky. You take Christ out of Christianity, it's like taking the notes out of music. It's like taking the numbers out of mathematics. You can't have Christianity without Christ. Christianity is Christ. And as we walk with Christ, the desire of our heart should be to know Jesus Christ better. To love Jesus Christ more. And to serve Jesus Christ more faithfully. I want to close with a story that I found in a book some years ago. The book is titled Living with Love. It was written by Josephine Robertson. In that book, she told a very moving story. In 1883, a young preacher, the Reverend Joe Roberts, arrived by stagecoach in a blizzard to minister to the Shoshone Indians in Wyoming. This great wilderness area had been assigned to the Protestant Episcopal Church by President Grant. And soon after Joe Roberts arrived, the son of the chief was shot by a soldier in a brawl. And Chief Washanky vowed to kill the first white man which he had. Well, Joe Roberts knew that this might mean the start of a long and a bloody war. So he decided to take action. And he sought out the Shoshone Indian Chief's teepee. It was 15 miles away in the mountain. And when he found that teepee, Joe Roberts stood outside. He called Chief Washakie's name. And when Chief Washakie appeared, Joe Roberts took off his coat, he opened his shirt, and he said these words, Chief Washakie, I have heard of your vow. I know that the other white men have vanished, but I am alone. Take my life for the life of your son. Well, Chief Washakie was amazed. And so he motioned this young preacher, Joe Roberts, to come into his tent. And he asked him a question. He said, how is it that you have so much courage? And Joe Roberts told him about Christ. He told him about the love of Christ. How God had sent Christ to this world and how he was born as a baby. And how he lived a sinless life. And how he took our sins upon himself on Calvary's little rugged cross. And he shed his precious blood to pay the debt of our sins so that we might be forgiven. Then he talked about Jesus' resurrection. And then he talked about Jesus' teachings and how that Chief Washanti could have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ if he would only repent of his sin and turn to Christ. They talked for hours through the day, through the night. And when Joe Roberts left, the chief of the Shoshone had renounced his vow to kill, and he had resolved to become a Christian. Now you say, how could that happen? Only one way, Chief Washanki had seen Christ's love in action. He saw Jesus was real because Jesus was in Joe Roberts. Joe Roberts was willing to lay down his life for us. That's the life that is real this morning. My prayer is that you've experienced that life. My prayer is that if you have received that life, you will share that life with others. There are people that you can touch. There are people that need a witness. God help me to be a witness like Joe Roberts. 
God, help me to live in such a way that people will know Jesus is real because they can see Jesus. Amen. Sister Michelle is going to lead us in a hymn of invitation this morning. We're going to invite you to stand and we're going to invite you to sing. The altar is open. If you just should desire to come and pray, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and would like to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, be happy to show you from the Bible this morning how you could be saved, how you could trust in Jesus. Would you come? Perhaps there's someone here today, you're a child of God, you're a Christian, you know Jesus is your Savior and your Lord, but you've been overwhelmed with the circumstances, the problems, situations in your life. Would you bring those burdens to the Lord this morning? Would you cast all your cares upon him? He cares for you today. Let God have his will and way. Mm -hmm. 